All right, well, welcome tonight. This is uh, lesson two of uh, spring 2024, and this is uh, the second lesson in Ecclesiastes. Tonight we're going to be looking at the Brevity of Life poem, the first one, and we'll be in Ecclesiastes 1, uh, 2 to 11. So that's where we'll, we'll open Scripture here tonight. And uh, we talked about the preacher last night, last week, uh, and we're gonna, he's going to introduce himself tonight, and, uh, and we'll talk a little more about his identity, his Salomic identity. Um, I told you that the preacher is, as we go through the book, is going to put his finger right in your chest. Well, tonight he's going to slap us upside the head twice and get our attention immediately here tonight. And we're going to be talking about the brevity of life. And, uh, and we'll also probably get into some discussion of God's faithfulness as, uh, from the past, today, and tomorrow. We'll talk about that. Well, let's pray. Uh, again, we'll open here in uh, Ecclesiastes 1. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the privilege of meeting tonight to open your word. Thank you that your word is eternal. It's unchanging and that you're faithful and you keep your word. Open our minds to hear what you would speak to us tonight. Help us to understand this very difficult and complicated book. And help us, Lord, to grow as we leave out of here, not just with curiosity, but to grow in our faith and grow in our obedience to you in all things. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, any, any questions from last week? We did the introduction to the book. Talked about the structure, talked about the different interpretations, talked about uh, the identity of the preacher. Anybody remember last week? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk about that here in just, just two seconds. We'll go back and kind of review that. So let's read this. Uh, we're going to read uh, uh, verses 1 to 11 tonight. And, uh, and we'll concentrate first on uh, 1, 1 through 3. Uh, if you remember from the introduction last night, this first part, one through, verses 1 through 3, is the first framing section. There's a framing section on the back end of the book. There's a framing section on the front end of the book. And this you know, basically sets the tone for the whole book. And he's going to put this right in our face and challenge us. So let's listen here. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What advantage does man have in all of his work, which he does under the sun? All right, so the verse 1 there, um, is, he, say, he identifies himself as the preacher. And we talked a little bit last week about how the Hebrew word here is Quihohalet, if I'm pronouncing, I'm doing justice to it. And it, it has the idea of bringing people together in a public setting. So it could be translated, and some of your Bibles may have preacher, some of your Bibles may have teacher, uh, depending on the, on the uh, version that you've got there. And he goes on and he said, he identifies himself as the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So how many sons did David have that ended up being king in Jerusalem? One. One. And he was? Solomon. Solomon. Okay. Um, and, and again, I, I won't cover it all like I did last week, but there's a lot of uh, different interpretations about who really wrote this book. Uh, there's one, the traditional idea is that it was Solomon himself. And then you get into a discussion of when in life did he write this book? Is this, did he write this book at the end of his life after all the things we know that went on with the thousand wives and all that sort of thing? And he's looking back, or did he write it before all that? There's arguments both ways. There's another major view is that this is a, um, a technique that was used in a lot of ancient wisdom writing that it was called, where it was called a fictive King, uh, King's autobiography. In other words, a wise man would take on the persona of a king, and we'll talk about reasons for that in a little bit, uh, so that he could make a point. He could make a point. 
And Solomon, obviously, uh, he's, he is presumed to be the author of most of the Proverbs. We're told from other scriptures uh, we looked at last week that he was the wisest man on earth that's ever been on the earth. And he would have clout to take on the, per, the persona of Solomon would give our author clout if this was to be a wisdom book. All right. The third view is that this book is a, uh, a, 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 a grouping of writers from many authors, up to nine. And you get into the arguments I talked about last week uh, from literative um, criticism, literary criticism about the different gender, uh, genders, genre of the book. There's poems, there's narrative, there's uh, autobiography, um, and that, well, maybe a different person wrote all those things and they were all just stitched together. A subset of that is these were Solomon's writings and another editor came and edited them together. So there's various scholastic views. The, like I said last week, I'm gonna take the position that this is a fictive autobiography, is that there's a wise man who's taken on the persona of Solomon to drive home some points. And why would you want to be Solomon? To, you know, uh, we'll talk a lot more about this next week. But what did, Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. He had wealth out the wazoo. So he was not constrained financially at all. He had um, political power. And, and Israel at that time was very powerful uh, in its area. So there were no restraints or constraints on his ability to go and do some of these things that he tells us about in chapter 2. And, uh, and all these different experiences in life to investigate wisdom and investigate life. And so that's why it's good to be Solomon, right? He didn't have any barriers that prevented him like some of us would be more limited on, on some of the things we might try and go do. Well, Solomon um, is kind of like the Superman figure here in that he doesn't have any restraints on him. If he wants to go try something, he can do it, and nobody's going to stop him or tell him no. Any questions on that, about Solomon, who, what the identity is? Because we're going to find that there's, as we go along here over the, over the spring, there's parts of this that sound a lot like what we think Solomon would be. There's other things that you wonder, well, why would Solomon say something like that? Um, he's going to talk about his son, He's going to talk about it, women uh, in not so great a way. Uh, as we go along, he's going to um, uh, see oppression and see injustice and not take any action or have any empathy for uh, injustice. Well, if he's the king, he had the power to, to do something about it. So, there's, so you see this, you know, the, the plus and the minus here about uh, Solomon as we go along in the book. All right, so... Um, that's a little bit about the preacher. And, and um, again, watch for this as we go along week to week about, if, is this really Solomon and how would he see this if he was really the king and had all those uh, uh, abilities versus being a, uh, a, an author who's taken uh, that viewpoint. All right, well, if, if somebody says Ecclesiastes to you, what do you, what's the first thing that comes to mind? The first verse that comes to mind. Okay, there's a time for everything we're going to talk about tonight. And vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Um, all right, this word vanity uh, is the Hebrew word is, uh, I've got it up here on the board, H-E-B-E-L. In Texas, we would probably pronounce it Havel. It's with a V in it, uh, but that, that's how it's uh, properly pronounced. And it means, it literally means mist or vapor. We had a lot of mist this morning. We had the fog, right? It, so it's the idea that you, you reach for it and you open your hand and there's nothing there. It's this, it's this idea of a mist that doesn't have any tangibility to it. It doesn't have any substance to it. And the... There are kind of two main ways to interpret this word. Uh, the English word is usually vanity. Most of your versions probably use the word vanity. 
Does anybody have anything different tonight? Futility. Futility, okay. Meaninglessness, Meaninglessness. uselessness, okay. So you see there's, there's nuances here. Um, I told you last week about these different interpretive views of the book. And a lot of that comes down to how you interpret this word Havel. And it kind of goes in two main directions. This idea of fleeting and nothingless, nothingness and uh, the idea of being ephemeral, the idea of being without profit, that you've invested in something and at the end of it there's nothing in your hand. The other side, and I'm going to kind of lean toward this side as we go through, is this idea of absurdity. Uh, maybe uh, when we were growing up, you'd hear the term, well, this doesn't compute, right? That these two things should fit together, but they don't. Um, think of it this way. If you had a, um, if you like to do puzzles, okay, well, what if somebody mixed two or three puzzles together and then took a few of the pieces apart and you tried to solve the puzzle? It just didn't, it, it, the pieces don't fit. The pieces don't fit. The picture doesn't come into focus. The idea of absurdity. Um, along with this, you'll hear people talk about paradox. I saw this and this, and they shouldn't go together. They shouldn't coexist, but, but the preacher says that they do. And uh, enigma, this idea that something just can't be figured out. It's just so contorted, it can't be uh, understood. Okay. So this idea that life is, is, is absurd, that things just don't fit together right. So we'll be, I'll probably talk about some of both of these, but I'm going to kind of lean toward absurd as we go through the, um, uh, you know, the classes here this spring. So think of it this way. Absurdity of absurdity, says the preacher. Absurdity of absurdity, all is absurdity. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Have you ever felt that way? Times in your life? Anybody want to share anything? When life seemed like it was pretty absurd? Yeah. Um, years ago, we, um, we were living in Vegas and working hard, doing a lot of stuff, and then all of a sudden the bottom fell out. And that's in 2006, 2007, 2008. And you thought, like, what's all this about? Because out of nowhere, you wake up one morning and it's just about all gone. Yeah. Poof. Poof is what? Poof. Life changed on me. Yeah. Now, it took a long time to get there. I mean, it's from years and years and years and years, but then poof, it was gone. Okay, that's a good example. Yeah, anybody else? When life felt like it was absurd? I'm going to give another example. <clears throat> we got married. We hadn't been married, what, seven years? Mm -hmm. He gets a job in Las Vegas. I get a job in Connecticut. <laughs> From that point on, we lived apart for 13 years. And there was a point I was thinking, God, why are we even married? Why, why are we together? <coughs> why, did we, why did we come together and, and you know, have, have what we have and now we're thousands of miles apart? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me at least. And the reason we had to do that, she was a project manager and that's where they sent her to. I was nuclear quality assurance so I had to stay with her where the nuclear work right. was the test site in Las Vegas. Right, right. Yep, yeah, that's a strange one. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's, so the preacher, his, his point, he, you know, he's going to slap us right upside the face. You know, the second verse here in the book, everything's absurd. Nothing makes sense in this life. That's what he's, you know, he, he's just blowing it up. You know? Now, last week I talked about Proverbs and, 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 and that Ecclesiastes, in a way, is a challenge to Proverbs. Proverbs says... If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. If you have this behavior, you'll have this outcome. If you obey God and fear God, wealth, honor, and life come to you. 
Well, the preacher has just pushed the plunger and blown that to pieces, hasn't he? He's saying, maybe not. Everything is absurd. Not everything, A doesn't equal B, or A doesn't go to B. Maybe A goes to D. Maybe A goes to E. Maybe A doesn't go anywhere. It's absurd. That's, that's, that's what he's telling us here. And so he's challenging us, our concept of the fear of God. Um, now, he's going to, verse 3 there, What advantage does man have in all of his work, which he does under the sun? So if I live a life, maybe in Las Vegas, I live this life, I get to the end of the life, and he's going to tell us later, we're all going to die, and I can't take anything with me, and whatever I had is going to go to some nimcompoop who's going to blow it. What's the point? That's what he's saying here. That's absurd. I work a whole lifetime. I try to, I try to do good. And at the end, of, and when I die, poof, it's gone. And somebody else is going to get it. And, nobody's, and he's going to tell us in just a minute, nobody's even going to remember me. And he said, what profit is there under the sun? Now, a key, key point here, verse 3, he brings this phrase up real early in the book, which he does under the sun. Okay, that, that's, that put neon, put neon marker on that, because and, and, that's going to be a continual theme as we go through the book. This idea of under the sun is only what's physically on earth. So he's, he's not taking into account eternity. He's not taking into account God's presence. He's only making allowance for the material, the, you know, the things that I can see in the processes that are on the earth as, as it exists now. So he's, he's not including eternal things. And this is going to be, the, he, he challenges himself as he challenges us as we go through the book to, to the reality that under the sun is not all there is. But he's saying, under the sun, man left to himself, with no light of eternity, it's all without profit. That's his thesis statement that he's challenging us with. So, kind of back to Proverbs. The idea of Proverbs is that a man, you know, if you fear the Lord, he's going to be blessed in this life. And, um, you know, the Psalms... Uh, go, you know, I mentioned last week that Ecclesiastes is heavily, there's at least 50 connections with Psalms and about the same number directly with the Proverbs. In Proverbs 1, of verse 6, excuse me, Psalm 1, verse 6, if you fear the Lord, the outcome is, uh, uh, well, it's wise, wise living, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, so it's talking about eternal judgment here, but the way of the wicked will perish. Okay? The promise of this, of this psalm here is that God has eternal judgment here. The preacher is slapping us in the face saying, do you believe that? What advantage does man have in all of his work which he does under the sun? So he's challenging us to think about this. Any other thoughts so far? I think that, in, and I'm going to use your reference, Proverbs, because Solomon wrote Proverbs to the church he attributed to right now. Well, he wrote that then when he was young and walking very closely with the Lord. Well, we know in his old age, he walked away from God, got into idolatry, uh, you know, 700 wives and 300 That's one theory. That, that is certainly one theory. That Solomon is at the end of his life and he's made a mess of things and now he's trying to make now he's trying to figure it out. Right? 
That's one, that's one theory of the book, yeah. Um, but if he's the wisest man that ever lived, why couldn't he figure it out? <laughs> that's for us to learn from, right? And if, it can, and, and if the wisest man that ever lived can fall into idolatry, why can't we, right? Idolatry to the point of sacrificing human beings. Yep, 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 yep. So, well, and, and hold that thought, because we're going we're to hit another angle on that here in just a minute. So this under the sun, it's used uh, 28 times in the book. It's this idea that we're living fleeting, mortal lives in a creation and this is the biggest absurdity. Under the sun, what's going on? Man's in constant rebellion against God, his creator, and we just talked about idolatry, constantly, constantly being enticed toward idolatry in the worship of, of other gods of his making besides the creator. Is that absurd or not? Here's man created in the image of God, Genesis 1. And keep Genesis 1 in the back of your mind as we go through the whole book because the preacher is. He's thinking about Genesis 1 the whole time. Here's man created in the image of God and everything under the sun is leaning toward idolatry and rebellion against God. Is that absurd or what? Right? That's, that's the ultimate absurdity that he's talking about here. Now he's going to, this next section, um, he's going to talk about this, this absurdity is never ending. There's this never ending oppression of absurdity. Before, before we go there, let me, let me show you two scriptures that kind of bear this idea out. Romans 8, uh, verse 20 and this is uh, Romans 8 is where Paul is talking about the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me get there. Romans 8, 20. And uh, this is NASB, and it's going to use the word futility. But it's the same idea that we've been talking about. For the creation was subjected to futility. Talking about at the fall. Not of its own will, but because of him, of God, who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into freedom for of the glory of the children of God. So it's, the creation is in futility. That's what, that's what the preacher's telling us. And there's a day coming when God's going to free, redeem man and redeem the creation and get, them, and get out of this uh, uh, futility. Uh, another one I wanted to show you was Deuteronomy 28. And Moses is writing here, and he's warning the children of Israel, here's what life is going to look like if you choose to walk away from God. The Lord will smite you with madness and with blindness and with bewilderment of heart. And you will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways, but you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually with none to save you. So think about as you read the news today. Okay? Madness, blindness, bewilderment of heart. Groping as noon. Does that sound like the front page of our news? Okay. This absurdity, right? This absurdity of life under the sun. That, that's what he's talking about here. So there's, uh, there's no perspective here of eternity or of a supernatural God. But then what he's going to go on to do here is now he's going to offer as his proof point, he's going to slap us upside the head again, and he's going to talk about these cycles of life in verses 4 to 9. So here we go. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place it rises there again. Blowing toward the south, then turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along. So you get the idea of a circle, right? Turn to the south, turn to the north. Everything's in a cycle, in a circle. 
All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. So there's the water cycle. We all learned back in eighth grade geology or so. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. So here, here you go. For that which is in is, that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. So what's the, what's, what's the point of these observations about the physical creation? Okay, okay. Well, but it, it's, it points kind of the opposite here. That, that, that's, I, I mentioned last week, Ecclesiastes, the preacher's been cu accused of a lot of contradictions, that he will contradict himself when it fits his purpose. So here he's saying the whole world is vanity. It doesn't fit together. And then he steps back and he looks at the physical creation that since the fall... The rivers have been flowing, the wind's been blowing, all this just keeps going. Now, is that really true? There, it never changes? To an extent, yeah. Two years ago, we had some change when the freeze came and we had a foot of snow around here, okay, right? So there are, there are aberrations in this, but his point is the physical creation, God's majesty in the physical creation just keeps working. It just keeps working. Well, what does that, how do you and I stack up against that in view of the, of the, phys, the physical creation that just keeps working? These have been, you know, this has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. But he says that the eye is not satisfied That's the point. That's the point. All this, all this physical creation, right? The rivers have been running to the sea, and the water evaporates, and it falls, and the rain, and the rivers flood back to the sea, and all that just keeps going. Man can't change that. It just keeps going. And you and I are here for a blink. And this has been going on for, if, if you, you know, pick... Pick your favorite. The Earth's been around here about 4.3 billion years is the latest science. But so this, this creation has been <laughs> chugging on, and you and I are here for a blink. That's vanity. We're, we don't, we're here for a blink, and we, come, we, we don't leave a mark on any of this. There's nobody, there's nobody that's changed the rivers or changed the wind, any of these things, right? You and I, we, we can go out and we can wave and we can grab the wind, but, you know, we're not going to change anything that goes on with the wind. As the psalmist says, we're the dust in the wind. Yep, yep. <laughs> yep, yep. Now, there's two key words here I want you to pick up on. I told you that he always has Genesis, the, the creation story, in the back of his mind, okay? So look at verse 4. First key word is generation. Does that ring any bells? You're on the right track. Genesis is the book of generations, right? And these are the generations of, and it goes on and lists them. And these are the generations of Noah. We're going to talk about that Sunday in Sunday school. These are the generations of Noah. So he's, he's got Genesis on his mind. He's taken us back to the original creation. And the other key word here is the next phrase, but the earth remains forever. Well, the earth is created in Genesis 1. So he's taking you back to Genesis and saying, what has happened since Genesis? The earth has continued to go on, 
and men have come and gone and gone and come in the blink of an eye. And that's our existence, and that's vanity, he says. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. In other words, you can't change this world we're in, this absurd world we're in. Human agency can't change it. So there's nothing new under the sun in this physical world. You can't change it. All right, that's, does that perk everybody up tonight? Does that, uh, that get you pumped up? Yep. Well, that's what he's doing. He, he's, I told you he's going to slap us in the face. He's going to put his finger right in our chest and says, is this true? Is this true? And this was a common practice of these sages, these wise men in ancient times. This was a teaching practice that they would have. And some of you may have had professors or teachers who did it this way. They'll, they'll say something strong and they'll want you to react to it or prove it wrong or challenge it, right? Well, that's what the preacher's doing here. He's not, and he's not sugarcoating anything, right? He's painting it all in the bleakness of the situation of life under the sun, corrupted by sin. And we're going we're to go on and talk about this. And he's going to go and talk about that literally everything under the sun is corrupted by sin. There's, no, there's nowhere to hide under the sun. So um, just a word about these cycles. Look at, um, I, I had some psalms there um, that uh, I wanted to look at. Psalm 39.5. going to talk about some of the, uh, it'll have a bearing on this a little bit. Psalm 39, 5 to 6. Behold, thou hast made my days as handbreadths, and my lifetime as nothing in thy sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere beast. Well, guess what? The preacher's going to talk about, he's going to compare the death of men and the death of beast. And at one point he says, there isn't much difference. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make up a, an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. So the preacher could have written this verse too. Isaiah 40, verse 8. That's the, the power of Scripture. It, God, God sprinkles His thoughts consistently through His Word. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 8. This one you've heard, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. But we're just like the grass and the flowers. Here today, gone tomorrow, right? Um, uh, the, I won't re read this one, but Psalm 104.5 makes reference to this idea of the sun uh, running its course, and then he gets up the next day and he runs his course again. You know, this idea of the cycles in the, in the natural creation. And in um, Psalm 19.6, uh, hits on this also. Here it is, talking about the sun. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. So the sun, right? And he's just doing his thing. It's part of the, the cycles of the creation. But in the psalmist, he's always given God the credit for making it as what you just described. And he's praising God for the gloriousness of that creation. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing. It, it prompts us to do that. Uh, in Romans 1, I won't, I won't chase that right now, but Romans 1, right, talks about the, the glory of the creation testifies to man of the existence of God. And that's what this, you know, this, you know watching the sun go by every day, that's a testimony of God's uh, power and creation and mercy that he keeps the sun up every day, right? And so that's the other response here. 
Now, I don't think the preacher's looking, he doesn't lead us down that track to stand back and praise God for his constancy. If a constant creation can be made, well, wouldn't you expect you have a constant and faithful God behind that? I mean, that's the other way to think about this. Now, he's not, he's not dwelling on that part of the, of the idea, but that, it makes us go there too, right? To stand back and look at the creation and our, ourselves in light of the creation and stand back and praise God. But that means you have to assume that there is something past death and that there is a, a, a spiritual God there. But he... Yeah, and as we go through the book, he's going to start cracking that door open, right? But he's throwing this in your face. He's poking you in the chest with this assumption that this, this clock's just turning and you come and go and you're not going to be here very long and your life's going to go poof. So he's putting that right in our face to challenge us. As the book goes along, he's going to start cracking the door open to faith. And by the end of the book... He's going to call on, actually in the middle of the book, and then he hits it harder even at the end of the book. He says, There's, you have to fear God. That, that, that's what gives you meaning and purpose in life, is knowing that there's a judgment in eternity by, by a faithful God. But right here, right here, he's just throwing it right in your face, saying, stand back and look at your life. Wake up call. Okay. So all things are wearisome. Uh, verse 8 and 9. Anybody remember the movie Groundhog Day? The guy's alarm clock would, would go off and he'd get up and he'd go through the day and he'd go to sleep and the alarm clock would ring and he'd go through exactly the same day. It just was the same thing over and over and over again. That which has been is that which will be. That which has been done is that which will be done. So there's nothing new under the sun. Groundhog Day. Um, that's hopelessness. That's a prescription of hopelessness, right? So what's the purpose of getting up in the morning if you know that tomorrow's going to be exactly the same? So, but is that true, that nothing ever changes? Okay. Yep. I've known some people with depression. Yep. And I actually know a guy that eventually committed suicide because of those two kinds of feelings. Okay. It's not worth it. My life's not going to amount to anything. There's no point in living it. Right? Um, but he's, at, he's challenging us to think here what will change this cycle? He said, nothing's new under the sun. So what has to happen to change this cycle? Something from outside under the sun is going to have to intervene to make it different. Now, this book doesn't go much in that direction. I mean, he, he's not going to talk about a savior. He's not going to talk about Messiah or anything. But that's, that's the other takeaway here. If the only way life under the sun's going to change is if, if, if God exists and God's going to choose to change it some way. Um, so, uh, and, and that's why I read Romans 8 to you, right? What's going to change is when Christ comes back and God redeems mankind and the creation. That is what other scripture tells us. Uh, I'm not going to chase it, but Revelations chapter 19 to 22 then documents what it's going to look like when God intervenes and changes this brokenness and this absurdity that's going on under the sun. But the, the other point that um, the preacher's getting at, so there's nothing new under the sun. Man has no agency to change this. We can educate people. We can build things, we can get smarter, 
but it ain't going to change this fundamental absurdity of what's going on under the sun because of the effect of sin. Um, list all these things, but since he doesn't acknowledge the creation of this, it's almost like today's astrologer says he just looks at it and says, this is all because of it just happened. It just yeah. happened. It was random, random things came together, and it Big just bang. happened. Right, right. Yeah. So he's starting you there. Like I say, as he goes through the book, the door is going to crack open to the existence of God and to faith and to God's sovereignty in this. Yep. Now, you know what deism is? Have you heard the term deism? Okay, a lot that was very popular during the Enlightenment in the uh, 1700s and even into the early 1800s. A lot of the founders of this country were deists. And it was the idea that there was an impersonal God who wound the clock up in creation, right, and set the clock on a shelf and walked away. That God didn't care about what was going on in his creation, and it was just a physical, bunch of physical processes in... God didn't worry about individual sin and individual uh, virtue. He just walked off and left the clock ticking. Okay, well, this, is, this has some of that idea to it, that God has put this, this clock ticking and it's running and that you and I can't do a thing about it and we're just trapped inside the clock. And he's going to hit on this idea some more as we, as we go through the book here. So, yeah, but he's... I think he's a man of faith. I'm, I'm taking that position, that the preacher is a man of faith. But he's starting you off by slapping you in the face with this idea that under the sun, it's all broken, it's busted, and you can't do a thing about it, and you're only here for a blink. Well, he uses a word that we heard over there tonight. Are you saying he repented from his idolatry and has come back home? We have never been told in Scripture that Solomon repented. No, but that's what I mean. And that's another reason, to me, that this is an argument for a fictive autobiography. It's not really Solomon writing this. It's somebody who's taken on some of the persona of Solomon to make a point. But this, you're, you're, you're making a good, this is part of the argument about the authorship here and whether it's Solomon or not. Because if the authorship is not really Solomon, then those points where he says, Perhaps, because we're never told that he repented of his idolatry. We're never, we're never, it's not recorded in any, any scripture. So we're all going to learn together on that one. Yeah. So let me get two more verses in here tonight. Um, uh, verses 10 and 11. So he's going to keep challenging us here. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, it's new. Already it has existed for ages which were before us. There is no remembrance of earlier things and also of the latter things which will occur. There will be for them no remembrance among those who will come still later. Now I asked this question last week. How much do you remember about your fifth great grandfather? How much do you know or remember about your great uh, grandfather? Never, I never met mine. I only have a, I have a couple stories on my mom uh, on my mom's side, uh, and we've actually um, we've done a little ancestry digging, and we found some information about some of these people that told us a little bit about their character. But do we remember these people? Uh, how, many, how, many, how, many, how many of you remember who was the fifth president of the United States? Okay, right? That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. We come and we go and nobody remembers us. Nobody learned from what we had to face and we didn't learn from what the people before us had to face. So he's painting. 
It is. It is. It is. It is. I told you. I told you. There's. There's. I told you. There's going to be parts of this book you were just going to want to go up in a building and jump out. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But Sadie, that's exactly why he's punching us in the face with this, because he's wanting us to think about how is life under the sun really operating. What do we really believe about life under the sun? Well, there's good news. Um, uh, I've, I've, I had some other ones here. Some of them we talked about. Uh, the, this idea of not being remembered, that, that sort of idea. Uh, Exodus 20, 3 through 5. Anybody recognize that scripture? This is the giving of the Ten Commandments. And... Uh, you know, the first command that God gives us here, Exodus 20, is what? What's the first commandment? Verse three, I am the, I'll start in verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And the point of that is where, what he's asking us to do is to think about how are you supposed to live if you're in this life under the sun situation? How are you supposed to live? And God, that's what the point of the Ten Commandments are, is he's starting to give us direction and guidance for how you're to live in this broken life under the sun, this, this place of absurdity. Right? How, how can the creation rebel against the God who made it and spend all of its time worshiping idols? And that's the point of the, of, you know, that's why I took you over the Ten Commandments there. The other thing to take away tonight the lasting power of sin. It calls on every generation, right? You talked about the generations. So every generation is faced with living in absurdity. Every generation has to repent. So each individual, each generation, you know, so the kids that are going to come after us and the ones that came before us were all faced with absurdity and this, this contagion of sin and it should prompt every person to repent. So, the, you know, we talked about, uh, I'll wrap up here tonight. Um, Psalm, I've got the listing there on the notes. Psalm 19, 1 to 4, Romans 1, 18 to 23. It's talking about the creation screaming out that God has exist and God has created the creation. So no man is without account. So everybody under the sun has, you know, the cycles were going on through my great-grandfather's life, and they're going on through my great-grand, my life, and they'll go on through my grandkids' life. The wind will keep blowing, the rivers will keep flowing, and all of that testifies to God as creator. And they're faced with the same absurdity that we have been, and they have to have, they are, caught, they are responsible to repent just like we are. And the good news here is the thing is going to make the difference and break this absurdity is when Christ comes. And Christ has come in his final return. Let me take you to 2 Corinthians 5. This is good news tonight. We're, we don't have to be trapped in this absurdity forever. So 2 Corinthians 5, very familiar verse. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So Christ is the one who can break the cycle of absurdity. He's the one that can start ripping sin out of our lives. Um, Revelation 21.5, I'm not going to take you there. But what's going on at the end of the Revelation? All things are made new, Right? So God's going to, you know, he's going to, he's going to break this cycle of absurdity here. And it, like I say, every, 
generation then has been faced with this. And if you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 4, Let me get us there. Second one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's a call to repent. Blessed are those who mourn over this absurdity, over this contagion of sin, over the personal sin in our lives. So it's called to repent. You, know, you, you can look at what the preachers put in our face here, and it's a call to repent because we're all involved in this absurdity of sin. And we can also, again, he's pulling you back to think about Genesis 1. Well, what happened? Genesis 1, 26 and 27. When Adam's created, what's he to do? Well, work and bear the image of God. He's to bear the image of God. Uh, let, me, let, me, uh, but let me take you uh, some more good news here. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. When Christ intervenes in our lives, we've got a job to do. And guess what? It's to do what Adam was supposed to have done all along. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So Christ can break this cycle of absurdity in our lives now, and ultimately he's going to break the cycle for, for everything. But like Sadie said here, you know, as we wrap up tonight, you know, this, this makes you want to just go put your head in the sand or something, right? But he's painting this bleak picture of what the, the, the creation and rebellion under the sun against the creator is. And we're in the middle of it. And we're only here for a blink. And that's why he says it's absurd. What advantage does man have in all of his work, which he does under the sun? So he's throwing the bucket of cold water in your face tonight, right? And as we march through the book, there's still a lot of cold water coming. There's still a lot of cold water. But as he marches us through the book, we're going to crack that door open and start talking about this God of eternity. So any questions or discussion tonight? When you look at if you attribute He knew God. He walked with God. He had uh, special things and God blessed him mightily. And yet when he walked away from God, then you would have to think, well, how much easier it is for us that are not that wise to trip up and fall and walk away from God. Yeah, so every every man, woman, and child who's walked under the sun is vulnerable to false worship, to, to idolatry, toward rebellion with God. And the fact is, we all are. We all have been. Sure. Right? We pro it we meets Paul's statement. None. There's none all righteous. Sin. No, not one. Not one. Yep. Sin. So this is a, like I say, this is a, one way you can respond to this is repentance. Is repentance. But so many, this day and Yeah, so the, the point here is a lot of people would reject repentance, but that's what Solomon's saying. Every generation has been confronted with the testimony of the creation 
every generation has been confronted with the absurdity of life under the sin and this rebellion against the Creator. And every generation needs to repent. No exception, right? What has been will be. And so there's, there's, no, there's no human agency to change this. And the right response is repentance toward a God, a faithful God, who's going to, well, we're going to get to later, who's going to judge us all. Anything else tonight? If you had enough cold water tonight? All right. Well, next, next week, we're going to go to uh, Ecclesiastes. Uh, we're going to start in 1, verse 12, and uh, we'll go to 2, 11. So this is where Solomon, or the, the, right, or the preacher, is going to start going on his uh, research project to uh, look at all aspects of life and whether he can find any value in them whether there's any place where it's not absurd. And this is where it pays to be Solomon because he's got all the women he wants, he's got all the power he wants, he's got all the money he wants, and he can do anything he wants to do. So we're going we're to uh, start the research project next week in Ecclesiastes, uh, going into Ecclesiastes 2. Okay. Bless God. We thank you, Lord, for your word and for your truth. We thank you, Lord, for how you are... You do not hold back and you confront us. You confront us with the fact of sin and rebellion in this life under the earth. And you call us to repentance. Thank you, Lord, for your promise that in Christ you make all things new. That you will break this cycle. You will break it for us individually and you will break it for eternity. And we give praise to you tonight in Christ's name. Amen.